welcome everybody. I'm Leonard Slapkin, and it's my distinct privilege and honor to be speaking today with pianist and author Jeremy Denk, who has a new book, which is called Every Good Boy Does Fine. Who would you say is your intended audience for this book? Is it people who already know you? Is it people who are interested in perhaps entering some part of the musical profession or at least playing the piano? Uh, the audience is anyone who loves music or is curious about classical music. I tried to keep it, there's a few little wonky bits. For the most part, I tried to write it for anyone to be able to read. Yep. Um, obviously, young people who are studying classical music might be interested in it. Uh, to save them some of the mistakes that I made, <laughs> you know, uh, to tell you, yeah, that's right, we're creating new ones. And then, uh, of course, parents who have kids who want to be musicians, it might be an interesting study of what that's like, you know, that there's a mm -hmm. lot of troubles advising your kids and how to relate to your kids when they're learning. And, and hopefully some teachers also, yeah. you know, I've gotten so many wonderful letters from musicians about this book so far. And so I am hopeful that, that it doesn't, um, annoy too many of them. Not at all. It's well-deserved. <laughs> it's a book that I think is, uh, with many books coming out about music these days, this one, it's different. It's very much you. I mean, you can hear your voice. It's written in your voice. That's True important. And it provides insight, entertainment as well. But we get a real glimpse into how you became the Jeremy Dank you are today, even though we have a lot of ground to cover between the end of the book and now, but we can see the building blocks <clears throat> in this book. It's a remarkable work in that, first of all, it's part autobiography, it's a part memoir, but maybe what makes it different than any other book of its kind is that the focus is placed really on the people and influences in Jeremy's first 25 years or so, his teachers. So my first question to you in reading the book, did you really keep all that music from when you were that young? Yeah, my mom, my mom was a very big memorabilia uh, keeper. Uh, and there were, and I kept all my music, of course, in a closet in the back room by the piano. And, and there was never any chance to throw any of it, of it away <laughs> for some reason. So uh, luckily it's all there and I could see what my teachers wrote and, and see what I played and when. And you know, I had some, some nice archeology span resources for myself. Another thing about that is that at least with me, I guess once I kind of moved on to the next level of instruction, I kind of put all that away and I have no memorabilia from my early years regarding those exercise books and all that. But one of the reasons was that when I got to my principal piano teacher who happened to be my uncle, he would create the exercises from the actual works of music we were playing. Uh -huh. So we basically abandoned all the charities and all those kind of things for doing things where well, you take a passage and then you say, okay, transpose it up a fourth. Do this, do that, do that. Let's do this in a different way with fingerings. Uh, did you do any of that at all? Or was it all strictly by the book? I think we did some of that. Uh, definitely isolated exercises from pieces, right? And, and I lost probably some of the things that Bill wrote out, Bill Leland, my teacher mm -hmm. in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of our time was on this Dokhnani book uh, that, that became my basic, you know, Bible between the age of 11 and 15. But um, also it sounded like kind of your nemesis in a way. Oh yeah, horrendous. Yeah, because it, it's a book that has no musical redeeming value. It's all about <laughs> concentrating, <laughs> you know. And he wrote wonderful music, by the way. Oh, he did. Uh, as you know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, I grew up in this world of uh, Russian trained teachers and musicians and family who surrounded all of us. We would never dare call our teacher by their first name, but it appears that aside from Shebok, you did. I, I always called Bill 
Bill, I think, back when I was a kid, although I may have sometimes called him Mr. Leland. Mm -hmm. He always called me chum or kiddo. Oh. <laughs> uh, never, never Jeremy. Uh, so, and then I think Mr. Schwartz, I called Mr. Schwartz in those oh. days, although in the book I write Joe, right? Because um, I thought of him that way more familiar for some reason. But then you're right, when I met Shabak, um, it was a whole other level of, he would never have tolerated. And anyway, I couldn't pronounce his first name. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had the privilege. Uh, I went to Indiana for three months and then they threw me out. Uh, so I got to know everybody there. Mm -hmm. And you know, hearing performances, particularly with the Janos and Shabak was mm -hmm. extraordinary. Sometimes people who are really that impressive when they're on stage, don't necessarily make the best teachers. But it sounds like Shebok really had a lot to tell you. Shebok was a very unique teacher and a very unique performer. Um, I think it's fair to say, you know, Starker is a very unusual case of like an incredible virtuoso who also had the language to explain to everyone in absolutely, you know, desperate detail everything that he was doing physically, right? Whereas mm -hmm. a lot of us, a lot of us feel like whatever gifts we have at the piano or whatever instrument, you know, we don't want to delve into them too deeply or else you know, we'll, we'll start overthinking everything. But for Starker, that wasn't a problem. And I think for Shebuk, he might have loved teaching more than he liked playing. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had a, it was a complicated relationship between the two. Uh, Starker, like so many teachers of his generation, and the ones who taught me, were merciless. I don't remember people ever saying anything positive. The idea being, at least in the Russian, old Russian style, that if it was good, you didn't have to say anything about it, and you only needed to comment if it wasn't. And in some ways, the, the, the better, the higher the teacher thought of you, the more harsh they would be on their students. So it's, it, look, I read, as I read this, you kind of felt somewhere in between. You, you had sympathetic teachers for the most part, empathetic, we can even say. Mm -hmm. what, what, did you see a difference between teaching methods today as opposed to how they were and how it affected you? I mean, obviously teaching methods and, and are so different today and what we think about in terms of inflicting emotional suffering on our students, you yeah. know, whether that's really a necessary part of the learning process. And I think it's a really interesting and complicated question. You know, I've lived through a real change of, of teaching styles. Uh, obviously, like Norman Fisher, the cello teacher at Oberlin, who was so important to me, you know, uh, he was the nurturer that my father and other piano teachers had not been, right? right. He, he was willing to say when it was good that it was really good, and he gave me, the, you know, this is scene in the book where he hugs me, and it's this kind of revelation that, you know, th this moment of emotional sharing, musically and and personally, put together, that that changed my whole way of thinking about music in in a, in a way. Um, but you're right, Shivak. The better that I thought that I played the meaner Shebuk was. Because he was trying to get more out of you. He was trying to get more, right. Yeah. Uh, and that was sometimes easy for me to see and sometimes very hard in the moment. And I, and I had heard stories of Shebuk earlier in his career, you know, playing somewhat mind games with his students. Yeah. I don't think anything he did to me was mind games. I was struck that clearly from a very early age, you had an uncanny ability to fall into analysis of the music you were playing uh, that was one uh, system that you seem to have developed uh, and that came naturally. Did you feel that analysis of musical materials was critical to understanding the music at an early age? I think it's fair to say I was pretty hopeless <laughs> at analysis until until I got to Oberlin undergraduate school. Um, then I began to get a taste of it. Uh, and I began to see what, 
was beautiful and interesting in it and how much fun it could be to sort of take the piece apart like a car engine and put it back together, you know? And then that did change me quite a bit. But a lot of the stuff you read in the book is my, you know, from, from my current perspective, looking back on right. magical musical experiences, like the opening bit about the Sinfonia Concertante, you know? Right. I, would, I wouldn't have analyzed it like that, you know, then, but I definitely felt all of that. You know, I knew something unbelievable was happening musically. Um, I wouldn't have been able to describe it in, in right. you know, coherent words. Yeah. My, my turning point piece was the Sloanwood of the Schubert cello quintet. Ah, well, that's and a great one. When, it, who was it? It was Hall Overton. He was a teacher at Juilliard. And he decided we were going to analyze that movement. And I walked out of the class. I wasn't having it. There are some, to me, there are just some things in music that I don't want to know other than it's beautiful. And if I know too much about it, I, I might lose perspective on the piece itself. That could be a difficult problem for musicians. I, th I think that's fair. Um, you know, sometimes analysis feels like dissection, uh, like it kills the thing that it <laughs> is trying to observe. Uh, but other kinds, other times I feel like I, it, it all depends on how you engage with the music and how respectful you are of the kind of experience of the music itself. I, I guess maybe you're right. Looking at it from our experience, and I've been around longer, you get to the point where you, it just comes to you automatically. You don't have to analyze it because we know already. But maybe as a young person, it's a good idea to understand the most important question we always have to ask, and that's why, why, why is this beautiful? Why does this happen this way? Why doesn't that kind of inform what we would call interpretation, the ability to say, I'm gonna do this here because. Mm -hmm. I, I, I no longer accept this, I feel it that way. No, this no longer is a, a reason to me that's valid. You have to have some musical understanding of why something is the way it is. Well, a lot of my teachers asked me that question in one form or another over the over the years. You know, Norman Fisher was mm -hmm. always trying to um, treat a piece like a like a script, like an actor's script, and then then you're always looking for the motivations of your characters, right? You know, the, the music slows down because it's thinking about itself. It's trying to figure out where to go next. Then it 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 erupts in this thing because it's decided. You know, he's always looking for this kind of human motivation which is a certain kind of why you know and then there are all these places where Shebuck tries to point out to me the kind of emotional logic if that doesn't sound like too much of a paradox you know um that the juxtaposition of this and that and yeah. suddenly you have these two opposites in close proximity and the music creates this kind of you know moment of friction between things. I guess there are those moments, those key moments in some pieces of music that we always remember because we didn't know how to deal with it and getting varied advice from the different teachers. So what did you make at an early age of different opinions about certain passages? How did you deal with it? I think it's fair to say up through Oberlin, right? Uh, when I, I went to college a little early at 16, up to that point, more or less, your piano teacher was the only authority, you know, with some little exceptions, right? Um, and so I treated everything Bill said, uh, William mm -hmm. Leland, I should say, uh, as, you know, kind of the word of God, but also sometimes kind of a pain in the butt, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes I did feel the music was something other than what he wanted it to me, but I would never have said that, right? I would have never have argued with him. And I think it was when I went to Oberlin as an undergrad and was clueless in so many ways. And, and all these different teachers suddenly starting to take me under their wing in different, in different capacities. Then all these voices coming in and a totally different way of, you know, uh, 10 or 20 totally different ways of thinking about music occurred to me. 
And that was hard. It was then eventually I had to escape from that. That was yeah. great. I learned a tremendous amount. And then I had to go back to Shevak and kind of limit it to one voice again for a while. I had the enormous pleasure of getting to know the conductor Carlo Maria Giulini. Ah. Uh, I used to spend time with him when he was guest conductor, principal guest in Chicago. And they used to play a series in Milwaukee. I would fly up from St. Louis, hear this uh, concert on Saturday, stay, and then go in the car with him to the Monday night Milwaukee series. And one day, you'll see where this is going. Uh, he didn't really talk about music per se. He always got around it in a different way. But he told me a story about a time when he went in for a major surgery of which the possibility of not ever waking up was certainly there. Mm -hmm. And he said at that point, he decided that he would always make a music, music a part of his life, but not his life a part of music. So in your book, you do talk about your childhood, you talk about family life and all these kind of things. Would you say that you had not a normal childhood, none of us in music ever have a normal childhood, but that you were able to experience more or less what other kids did at the time? Um, I think, I don't want to make any great claims to being unusual, but I think my childhood was a little atypical in, mm -hmm. in the sense that I was obsessed with success at school. The most important thing to me whether I got this from my parents or from my own perfectionism or anxiety or whatever, the most important thing to me was to do the best I could in every subject imaginable, English, math, piano, you know, whatever. And what was it, um, you had one, one B on a report card somewhere? Yeah, and I was just completely devastated by this, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was lucky if I got one B. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I had a very uh, anxious, you know, childhood in that sense. And I, of course, not really being sports oriented and being a pretty hyper nerdy kid. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really get along that well with a lot of different people and liking classical music didn't really help either, right? So um, I did miss out, but what was lucky was that in New Mexico, we met all these other kids who loved classical music and were just as nerdy, you know? Yeah. And we, we banded together and that saved me from certain things. I I'm sure. Think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I think today's younger musicians, because of, well, as we were talking now and other things, they have more access to the world than we had. Yeah, we had newspapers. Yeah, we had Walter Cronkite, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it's not the same as it is now. So young people, I think they could balance their lives a little more with an understanding of what's going on around them. I, I think that one of the running themes through the book is this compartmentalizing yeah. that goes on when you're when you're a musician. You know, you just tunnel vision on this piece, or you no, know, I'm not missing this stupid arpeggio, or or whatever it is, and that becomes the most important thing. And it has, you know, it's it's an important part of becoming a musician, uh, a classical musician certainly. Uh, but it's also damaging in other ways, right? Uh, okay. And and uh, I tried to chronicle that. I think the reason I put in the, a lot of the personal details in the book is that the the act of trying to learn to play well also was competing against some very dissonant threads, you know. And there were some really striking moments where I'm trying to just stay on music, and and life is is making that difficult. Uh, was there one defining moment when you said, I've been practicing, I've been working, this is really what I'm going to do with my life. I think by the time I was nine, I knew that I could not stop playing the piano. Uh -huh. It was like an addiction. I don't know how you felt about it growing up. Well, then, I, yeah. I, I had a whole different thing. Everybody yeah. in my family were musicians. Right, and right, right. I picked up violin when I was three, and knew I wouldn't be as good as my father, so I quit. Piano when I was eight, knew I wouldn't be as good as my uncle, so I quit. But you seem to have kept on this one path, even though you participated in other arenas of the musical experience. The piano was it for you. You, you really never veered from that. For the most part, because I felt, and I, I maybe still feel the same way, that I can say certain things at the piano that I can't say anywhere else. 
<laughs> but you know, it, it, it is a release valve uh, for me and a place where I can do something theoretically good in the in the world. <laughs> and, and it feels it feels good when it's right when it's right too, in a way that almost nothing else feels like that. Do you write music a little bit? I used to compose, I sometimes write little things. I write a lot of cadenzas, you know, for yeah. Mozart and stuff. But not really compose, compose. Do you these days, Letter to York? Oh, yeah. I've been, I've been yeah. writing it. In fact, I have a, an album out now that's uh, all my own compositions. Yeah. Uh, I found for me, uh, even the pieces I write now, and the pandemic, I, I wrote a lot of music. But what I would usually do is kind of say, OK, here's a problem. And I want to write a piece that solves the problem. I wrote for the youth orchestra here, which I founded 52 years ago, but for wow. the 50th anniversary, it had to be postponed. And what I did was I took the uh, Passacaglia motif in the Bach C minor, which is the very first piece the youth orchestra played. And I tried to juxtapose other Bach works into that, some of them Renaissance sounding, some romantic and some jazz ones. And then eventually it leads into everybody in the orchestra picking one piece of Bach individually that they want to play. And it becomes totally Oh, that's chaos. great. And then after all this builds, it gets louder and louder. There's an offstage piano that starts. You don't hear it at the beginning because the orchestra on stage is too loud. But when I cut off the orchestra, you hear da 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 ya, da 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 And then we do some stuff where the orchestra plays certain notes and they whisper the initials B A C H. But I enjoy these kind of little puzzles. It's it's great fun for me. Um, but we've gotten completely off our subject track. I want to ask something also that struck me in the book. And not that teachers do it anyway, but not much contemporary music or music yeah. of composers who are of the time. Yeah, I, I regret that aspect of it. Although it, well, once I went to Oberlin, contemporary music became a bigger part of my life. And I talk about that a little bit, maybe not as much as I should. No, uh, yeah. no. Uh, I think the reason for that is I was still wrestling with some of the, you know, dead old white European guys. <laughs> and, and that was such an important part of my emotional um, life and development as a musician that, and, and the contemporary uh, music I was learning I was very naturally gifted at playing a lot of contemporary music. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. Didn't, ca it didn't cause me the angst or, you know, it, like grappling yeah. with the appassionata was like the hardest thing in the world. But, you but, know, but playing but, Ligeti Etudes, I, I could kind of do that. You know what I mean? So I left that part out because uh, it didn't seem as interesting to me. But I mean, I played a lot of, you know, Chris Rouse. Yeah. Um, Larry Ratcliffe was the conductor of the contemporary ensemble. And he, he was an evangelist, right? And I and I, I talk about it a little bit, and I make a little bit fun of some pieces we played. Yeah, you know, which now in retrospect I realize were kind of good pieces. Uh, you know, but uh, I was really convinced by the time I was twenty two, you know, that the uglier or the more dissonant the music was, anyway. Um, yeah, I was really into that. Yeah, I yeah. was. I loved like music. Singing. It was like challenging the audience, you know, beyond belief, you know. Yeah, so the last time I heard you was uh, about two months ago, I guess, with the John, uh, the new John Adams. Right. Movie, yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is a, a very complex piece. Very oh, complex. Oh, geez. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the book ends kind of at 25 years old, roughly, right? More or less, except for the last and, chapter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that leads us to believe that, one, there will be another book, two or three, as we go <laughs> along, following your path in which you become the teachers that you spend the majority of the book talking about. What do you think you will do that's different than the people who influenced you? Um, I think there's little glimmers of me teaching at the end of the book, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and there's also a fast forward to a kind of moment when I'm very busy touring and, and also I'm a little bit burned out. Right by by personal losses and um, I I do often say and I do believe that much of the good stuff I have to teach is derived from the people you read about in the book and some others you know um, I, I really regret leaving out Miriam Freed who was actually yeah. a big a big influence she but her, yeah she was a you know really tough violin professor 
And she was very difficult. Her, her advice was harder to put on the page. I think that was what it is. It was harder to, it was, it was very nuts and bolts. And, uh, but uh, a lot of the stuff that I teach is Shebuck, mm -hmm. maybe also Miriam Fried, uh, uh, Norman Fisher. Yeah. Um, and, you know, musicology profs and things like that, you know, that I loved over the years. I left a lot of those out too, which I also regret. But, yeah. uh, I've got three books out there and I realize you just, the amount of stuff you leave out is much, far greater than what you put in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, yeah yes, so always. I, yeah. I'm almost finished with the fourth book. And then yesterday, just literally yesterday, I was sitting here and I had this idea could I, one of the things during the pandemic, you can't teach conducting, you know, you don't want an orchestra behind me here in the room. So that, that doesn't work, but you could teach score study that you could do. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if I could take 10 pieces of music that I know intimately and literally walk everybody through every phase of the piece as a conductor, what you need to know, what you need to look for and all that. So I, mm -hmm. I, I sort of wrote, half of Appalachian Spring and uh, right. the, the point is that there are things there are little triggers that we all have all of a sudden you you go in a direction that you hadn't thought before mm -hmm. and your your mind is so fertile and so interesting that we we don't know what you're going to do next maybe you don't either um but we love this adventure that you've been taking us on oh. it's phenomenal <laughs> it really is great yeah, yeah I tried to put some of the you know, I try, especially, well, there's on the one hand, preserving the amazing advice and knowledge that I got, you know, like trying to pass on an oral tradition in a certain right. fashion. And that's what makes the book unique. No, nobody's that, ever done that. That's right. And then, and then, you know, transmuting them into my own little essays where I, I try to look at some fundamentals of music in somewhat fresh and irreverent ways. And, and I hope that that works too. I had a lot of fun writing those uh, naughtier bits, especially. Well, Jeremy, thank you so very much. <clears throat> Have a great rest of your season. Take a little time for other activities. And I hope one, to work with you again soon and two, talk with you whenever. That would be a both a pleasure. And I'm so grateful to you, Leonard, for taking the time. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.